Assalamu alaikum, this is Dr. Hasna and today we will be studying about the shoulder joint. So the shoulder joint is a type of ball and socket joint of the synovial variety. Ball and socket because the head of the humerus is the ball and the socket is provided by the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Hence the articular surfaces taking part in the shoulder joint are the glenoid cavity of the scapula and the head of the humerus. However, what happens is that the head of the humerus is about four times the size of the small glenoid cavity. This causes a little weakness in the shoulder joint. Hence, a certain amount of factors to provide stability to the shoulder joint. Otherwise, the humerus will be dislocated easily. So, let's talk about those factors. There are about five factors in total. The first factor is the coracoacromial arch. What is this? Basically, as you know, that the coracoid process and the acromion process are lying just above the shoulder joint. Superior to the shoulder joint is the coracoacromial arch. And these two processes are almost parallel to each other. But for sake of understanding and drawing, I had to draw it, they, them being away from each other. So there is a ligament that runs from coracoid to acromion called the coracoacromial ligament. This ligament converts this entire area into an arch. Hence, First, if the glenoid and cavity and the humerus were trying to perform a movement, it was very vulnerable to dislocation. But when there is a coracoacromial arch, it allows the stability, at least superior stability in shoulder joint so that the humerus is not dislocated. Moving on, the second factor is the musculotendinous cuff or the rotator cuff muscles. Now, these were the SITS muscles uh, that we've studied in the scapular region chapter. These muscles are the subscapularis infraspinatus teres and the supraspinatus muscles. These muscles had tendons that were blending in the capsule of shoulder joint and causing strengthening of the capsule of the shoulder joint. The third factor is the glenoidal labrum. Now, what is glenoidal labrum? Name says it glenoid, meaning there is a glenoid cavity of the scapula. If you see, it's like rounded. In the margins of the glenoid cavity is attached a fibrocartilaginous rim that helps this cavity to get deepened. So if this is the glenoid cavity, there is a labrum attached on the margins of the circumference of the glenoid cavity. This allows that the initial, which was shallow cavity, now the cavity has deepened. So glenoidal labrum is the third strengthening factor of the shoulder joint. Other factors include the atmospheric pressure and finally a couple of muscles also strengthen the shoulder joints these are the biceps and triceps muscles moving on let's talk about the various ligaments of the shoulder joints so enumerating the ligaments of shoulder joint there are about four ligaments the first is the capsular ligament now basically capsular ligament is also can be called the capsule of the joint the capsular ligament is basically attached. Medially, it is obviously attached to round the glenoid cavity, extending beyond the supraglenoid tubercle. Laterally, it is attached to the anatomical neck of the humerus. So we know that the anatomical neck is basically separating the upper end from the head of the humerus. So the anatomical neck of the humerus, laterally, it is attached to anatomical neck of the humerus. Uh, However, the capsular ligament inferiorly extends till the surgical neck of the humerus. We all knew that the surgical neck was separating the uh, upper end from the rest of the shaft. So this inferiorly, this capsular ligament goes down up to the surgical neck of the humerus. This allows in mobility of the joint. However, it causes weakness uh, in the joint inferiorly. Hence, most of the dislocations of shoulder joint occur inferiorly or anteriorly, anteroinferior. And finally, anteriorly, this caps the capsular ligament is divided into superior, middle, and inferior glenohumeral ligaments. Let's talk about the next ligament. This is the coracohumeral ligament. The coracohumeral ligament, the name says it, it extends from the root of the coracoid process up to the neck of the humerus. Moving on, we have the transverse humeral ligament. Transverse humeral ligament. We all know that the humerus has a lesser tubercle a greater tubercle and between these two is the bicipital groove. So in the upper part of this groove, there is a ligament that is bridging the medial and lateral lips of the bicipital groove. This is known as the transverse humeral ligament. Long head of biceps brachii passes deep to this transverse humeral ligament and it is a part of the shoulder joint. And finally, the glenoidal labrum that we talked about earlier. This is uh, basically a fibrocartilaginous rim 
This covers the margins or the circumference of the entire glenoid cavity and increases the depth of the cavity as I mentioned earlier. So this was a summary of the ligaments of the shoulder joint. In the next video, we'll talk about the nerve and blood supply of the shoulder joint along with the scapulohumeral rhythm. Thank you for watching.